studying the way in which a dialectic material responds to uh, oscillating electric fields and how that then relates to uh, propagation of electromagnetic waves in that medium. And so uh, we're looking in particular at linear response where the polarization, the electric type of density, is linearly proportional to the field in the medium with the proportionality constant, the electric susceptibility. And for the moment, uh, we're taking this to be a scalar, okay? We're uh, assuming our, our medium is isotopic and responds in the direction of the applied field. And the way we can model that is by thinking about the molecular constituents in the material which, for which there is some molecular polarizability uh, such that the response amplitude at that frequency is proportional to the electric field um, amplitude at that frequency. And that proportional constant is called the polarizability. So generally, the relationship between chi and alpha is fairly complicated because of, as we discussed, so-called local field corrections. But when we have a sufficiently dilute sample, then we can write a simple model and just say, well, there's some number density of molecules, atoms, whatever it is, this dilute uh, uh, sample is. And we just multiply the polarizability times the density of the test. And thus, the dielectric uh, response, the permittivity, is then given as um, such. And from that, we can principle calculate the complex in mix of refraction okay, at that frequency. Now, again, we're, the, the point here is that we're looking at the response at a particular frequency. So we should be thinking about this, as we will in a moment, as the um, response in the frequency domain. That's to say we can think about this as the Fourier transform. They're one in the same thing. We study a frequency, for a, which doesn't exist, but we have an infinitely long wave train, because that is a basis for expansion of a physical signal. So when I write this in the frequency domain, I can either be thinking about this as I have a wave which is oscillating at that frequency, and this is the complex amplitude associated with that frequency, or equivalently I can think about this, this is my EFT, I can be thinking about this if I had a superposition of these, then the signal would look something like the integral of all the frequent positive frequencies This is the same thing as this when I now think about this as having multiple frequencies. Okay? Of course, they're not exactly the same. This thing has slightly different units than this, but conceptually, they are the same thing. Sorry, when those limits they put on the... Well, I put this from zero to infinity because this is just a positive. If I write this now as this, plus its complex conjugate. Over two, which is the real part, then I have the integral from minus infinity to infinity. Right, which is the Fourier transform. So the positive frequency component is the complex amplitude for multiple frequencies. Of course, there's a funky factor of two, which really shouldn't be there. It really should have been twice the real part, which is what's here. Okay. 
Okay, so we looked at a particular model which gets us a long way in understanding the physics, the so-called Lorentz oscillator model, in which we uh, think about the bound charges that make up this dielectric as being harmonically bound on a spring with the sum natural resonance frequency of omega naught and some damping rate gamma. And from that, we were able to derive the polarizability, as written here, the complex polarizability uh, through the, by solving the steady state behavior of the damped simple harmonic oscillator. Um, and from that, we can get the susceptibility. Now, here I've generalized things a little bit. I've allowed myself to say maybe there's not just one resonance frequency, but my molecules have many different resonances at which they will uh, absorb, right? I mean, if I had uh, you know, a molecule or an atom, of course we know, due to the uh, stationary states or the eigenstates of the bound states of the molecule, there are many different absorption resonances in the molecule. Of course, this was seen empirically before the invention of quantum mechanics. And the way it was dealt with was to put in a fudge factor to say that, well, there's some strength of the resonance, so-called oscillator strength. And we just weight each one of these complex resonances associated with a particular <laughs> damped harmonic oscillator, which has a particular resonance frequency and damping rate by some strength f. There is a relationship for that that we get from quantum mechanics in terms of the actual dipole matrix elements, if this is, we're inducing an electric dipole, et cetera, et cetera. But in the moment, it's, right now, it's just a fudge factor. Okay. Now, I should say, and something we're going to study in homework, that as we discussed um, last time, the real part of chi is related to the dispersion of the wave. And the imaginary part is related to the amount of energy that's transferred between the wave and the medium. When chi, the imaginary pi of chi is positive, as we have for the damp simple harmonic oscillator, so here's, of course, it's related to the imaginary part of alpha, then we have absorption, strong absorption, as the material absorbs the light, that's to say, work is being done on the charges by the fields. And that would correspond to a positive oscillator strength. In principle, as we discussed, say, for example, if we have a laser, we can also have the opposite be true. We can take energy from the medium and put it into the fields, in which case we have an amplifier. And we can model such an amplifier by making F negative. So if f is greater than zero, if the object rate is greater than zero, then we have an absorber. And if the oscillator strength is negative, then we have an amplifier. And that would just put the dispersion relations would look just the opposite. F negative. Okay, so we're going to study in homework some very bizarre and interesting properties that happen in the propagation of light in an amplifying medium of, away from the gain line. Talk about that in a little bit. Okay. All right. So we uh, then turned our attention. We have this this description of saying, let's look at the propagation of a pulse 
through a, a dispersive medium where we have imagined, for example, this is the input phase to our medium at z equals zero. We're just going to treat one dimensional propagation, ignoring the transverse spreading of, of the beam, um, where we have some signal that we're putting in at some time t, and it then propagates into the medium for z greater than zero. And so we can write down a formal solution to that instantly by using Fourier analysis. Because we can take our initial signal, break it up into its Fourier components. That represents the signal at the input phase at z equals zero, which I've written here in terms of the positive frequency component. And then we know then what the solution is for each frequency component. Each frequency component propagates as a plane wave with a wave number that's related to that frequency through the dispersion relation. And then we just add up all those plane waves, weighted by the amount of amplitude there was at that frequency which isn't changing in this linear region. All right, so that's the formal solution. And we uh, were looking at the problem of quasi-monochromatic pulse, where our input signal was some Pulse amplitude that modulated some frequency. Uh, so this is not the resonant frequency of the material. Omega naught is the what we call the carrier frequency. Okay, and this is a the pulse envelope, which is slowly varying with respect to the period of oscillation. And so we have some pulse envelope here, such that the if I were to then Fourier transform this and look at the uh, distribution here, um, that this thing has a spread in frequencies that's much, much less than omega naught. And so if I look at the Fourier transform of this signal, it has a very narrow peak centered at omega naught. That's the positive frequency component. Of course, there's an, an equal symmetric. In this case, I have a real function, so it's symmetric at the minus omega naught. Okay? And so in the quasi-monochromatic approximation, there's very little, uh, this tail has almost no support on the positive frequency axis. And so I only have to integrate over this centered at omega naught. So our um, signal in that case, what is the, that's to say, the signal at some later position z, that's to say the wave propagation downstream, was equal to the real part of the integral minus infinity to infinity. between omega and omega naught. Since this thing falls off very quickly, we can extend that integral from minus infinity to infinity, because it doesn't do much out here, just for simplicity. 
So this is approximately equal to the integral minus infinity to infinity, the integral over that difference between omega and the resonance frequency due to the i k delta omega i plus delta uh, minus delta t. Okay. So um, let's consider, although it's, we can do it more generally, but let's just focus our attention for the moment. Let's suppose that uh, we're in a transparent band where k is real. Okay, so there's no, we're ignoring the imaginary part of the index of refraction. So let's focus on that for the moment. Um, what we discussed is then since the support, this function is peak near delta equals zero and has very little extent compared to omega naught, we can do a Taylor series expansion of this function near delta equals zero because the integral is non-zero everywhere else except where delta is very small because of the narrowness of this peak because we have a quasi-mathematic pulse. So this was approximately then equal to in which case if we keep the terms to lowest to, to first order Delta, then this is equal to the real part integral e to the minus i omega naught. I'm sorry, e to the minus i delta t minus the derivative. Z e to the i k naught z minus omega naught t. Where k naught is equal to k at omega naught. So omega naught over c and at omega naught. So um, what we see here then, remember that the amplitude itself if we take the inverse Fourier transform over some dummy variable delta was equal to this. That's the inverse Fourier transform of this function. So what we have is the inverse Fourier transform evaluated now, not at t, but at t minus this. And this is 1 over the group velocity. So the group velocity of the pulse is defined as the derivative of omega with respect to k. So 1 over the group velocity is dk of omega with respect to omega at omega naught. That's the group velocity at the carrier frequency. And so the solution that we find is that this is equal to the pulse envelope evaluated now at t minus z over v group times the cosine k naught z minus omega naught. And that's the solution to this order of approximation to first order in delta.
And that solution shows the, the behavior whereby I start with some pulse envelope, which has some carrier. And later, what happens at some downstream is that the pulse propagates. The peak of the pulse travels down a distance z, where z is equal to v group times t at, at some later time. And the carrier wave travels. at the phase velocity. So the phase velocity is omega over k, not the omega d over k, which is c over the inductive refraction at that frequency. Everyone clear on that? Um, now, one of the things, I guess, okay, before I get into that, I want to say one, one other thing. What is the effect of this neglected next order correction in this expansion around delta equals zero? Would it cause a widening of the pulse? It does indeed. So let's look at this. This, this, uh, so the, the effect of the second derivative of k with respect to omega. Well, that's the derivative of the k the omega, <coughs> which we said was 1 over the group velocity. which is equal to the derivative of the group velocity with respect to omega divided by minus squared. Right? So, the effect of the second derivative is what we call group velocity dispersion, GVD. It says that, well, if I have a spread in frequencies, each little frequency piece, with if I go back here, I don't have a single frequency, I have a spread in frequencies. Each little frequency band has its own group velocity, even within this narrow band which means each little frequency band will travel, the pulse will travel at a slightly different speed because the group velocity is not fixed at omega naught, but is spread over the range of frequencies contained within this pulse. Some of those colors will travel with a faster group velocity, some of those colors will travel at a slower group velocity, and then the effect is to cause a spreading of the wave path. So whereas in vacuum, an electromagnetic pulse does not spread, okay? Unlike in quantum mechanics, where you get spreading of a wave packet, in electrodynamics, every, because of the relationship between omega and k, which is linear, that means that you have a constant speed, c, a pulse in vacuum does not spread. Longitudinally. If it goes in a dielectric, it can spread, and the amount by which it spreads depends on the second derivative of k with respect to omega. So we have a problem for that in homework to look, for example, at pulse propagation in optical fibers and how group velocity dispersion limits 
the rate at which you can transmit information down an optical fiber because, well, if you try to put a bit in a pulse in a certain time window, eventually they're going to, be, they're going to bleed into one another. Okay. Um, the group velocity itself, if we look at the group velocity, as a function of omega. Well, that's the derivative k is equal to n times omega over c. So this is then equal to 1 over c um, n of omega plus call the group index of refraction as the ratio of C to the group velocity. Unlike the index which is defined in terms of C over the phase velocity. This is what was called the group index. And that then is equal to, I'm sorry, this is 1 over R max. Because then this is equal to N of omega. So, um, you may remember from your previous studies that there is quite often the case in certain kinds of media, in certain material, um, that the index of refraction itself is less than one. And for example, in a plasma. And then the phase velocity is greater than C, right? And then one says, well, that doesn't really matter because no information is carried in an infinitely long wave train. I don't know. Because it's infinitely long, there's sort of no beginning, no end. No information was ever carried in that modulation of the phase. But the group velocity then, well, how big is that? Its relationship to C is the group related to the group index. So as long as this quantity is greater than 1, then the group velocity will be less than C. Well, is that always true? Actually, the group velocity can be greater than C. In fact, it can even be negative. So what the heck is going on? How do we talk about then information and the causality associated with being able to transmit information within the constraints of Einstein causality? And that's the topic that we want to take up now. The relationship between causality and material response. In order to do that, um, we want to discuss some general uh, ideas relating to what is called linear response theory. Something that is well known more in the 
engineering community than it is to a lot of physicists. Let me just explain what I mean. Let's say I have a black box. Okay? And there it is, it's a box, it's black. Meaning we don't know what's inside it. But what we do know is that we put some signal in and we get some signal out. Okay? And that signal, say, is a function of time, and the output signal is a function of time. And there's some relationship between these two things, which is linear. And that response function we'll call G. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean to say is that if it's a linear response, then the output depends on the input in a linear way. Now, I might write that more generally in the following sense. There's some doesn't necessarily have to be instantaneous response. So the response, the signal that I get out at some time t can depend on the whole history of the signal at some other times. And this function g tells me how to transfer the input signal to the output signal. Now we might want to demand certain other things other than linearity from this response function. Um, typically, we might be thinking about so-called stationary response, meaning that the nature of how this thing responds doesn't depend on the origin of time. So it's doing the same thing whether I do it today, tomorrow, in a year. Okay, so if, I, if it doesn't depend on the origin of time, that means that this only depends on the time difference between t and t prime. We don't have to assume that, but we'll restrict our attention to that. The other thing we want to assume is causality. That is to say, the signal at time t doesn't depend on what the input was doing in the future of t. It only depends on what it, uh, what it was doing at in the past of t, which means that when thought of as a function of tau, um, this is equal to zero if tau is negative. Okay. So that these simple constraints says a lot about the nature of this response function. In particular, we can see what those constraints are by looking at this problem by taking its Fourier transform and looking at its response in the frequency domain. If we look at this in the frequency domain, we have the following. So we have written, according to our stationarity assumption, this relationship between the input and output signals, which says in the Fourier domain, the Fourier transform, yes? Uh, since we have the causality restriction, can we just change that to zero to infinity? We can. I mean, well, it, it only goes up to time, time t. 
because beyond that, this is negative. But right now, I just want to leave it general with this property. Okay? Because we're going to see how that constraint works out. If I look at this in the Fourier domain, we know that the Fourier transform of, of this, well, this is the convolution of two functions. The Fourier transform of the convolution is the product of the Fourier transforms. So one thing we see, just generally speaking, causality or not, is that the uh, response function in the frequency domain is a kind of frequency filter. That is to say, there's some frequency dependence of this G. And to get the output frequency dependence of the signal, I just take the input and I multiply it by it. And I can weight the input by output, and that's it. And then I can take the inverse for each transform. Get that. Okay. But now um, we have causality. Causality says that this thing is equal to zero when this is negative. Well, what that means is that G of T itself is the same thing if I multiply G by a step function. So I'm defining the heavy side step function theta as the function which is 1 when its argument is positive and 0 when its argument is negative up to 0. Okay? So that's what's known as the heavy side step function. Any particular history behind the same? Got me. But we can, you, your guess is as good as mine. Probably pretty darn good. So what does that say? Well, it says that if I were to ask now about the frequency response of the, material, of the system, the black box, that there is a relationship now. that the Fourier transform of G must be equal to the convolution of the Fourier transform of the set function with itself. Right? Because if the function is the same thing, whether I multiply it by a step function or not, then in the frequency domain, it must be the same thing if I convolve it with the Fourier transform of that step function. And this puts constraints that are known as the Cromer's Kronig relation. And it's what we want to study in the context of material response. But it's more than just like magnets, and this comes up everywhere. If I'm looking at, for example, a scattering problem, where my input and output here now is I put in some, I'm sending some uh, high energy particles at a target, and I want to know what the scattered amplitude is. Again, because if I have causality, which I do, then that puts constraints on that scattering amplitude. It will tell us, me something about whether what the bound states are, for example, within that. 
So this is not just about electromagnetism. It's about whenever I have linear response, and it's an extremely important uh, tool that we use all the time in many different fields of physics. All right, let me grab my notes here and use this now as our last launching point to discuss, to get some more intuition about what's going on. Um, this GFT, so notes, GFT is known as the Green's function. Why is it known as the Green's function? Well, there's some differential equation which ultimate, typically um, relates a linear differential equation, in this case, which relates the input to the output. And G is the Green's function of that differential equation. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So let's, what, how do I understand what's an interpretation of G? Well, G is also known as the impulse response. Why do I mean, why do I say that? Well, let's suppose that the input signal itself was an impulse. I'm just going to put in a signal that's a very short pulse, which will write as a delta function at time. Okay, so that's my input. What is the output in that case? Well, there it is. I'm integrating uh, my um, Green's function here. So the Green's function can be interpreted as the output when given an input that is a delta function. That is what we call the Green's function of a different equation. It's what we studied earlier on at the beginning of the semester, not in the context of a time response, but in terms of space response, when we looked at Poisson equation, and we broke up the charge distribution in terms of a bunch of point charges that were delta functions, then we added them up. Because I could take, the reason is by linearity, the process is linear, that's essential, we have the principle of superposition. So that means I can take an arbitrary input signal at time t as an in, as a weighted <coughs> sum or integral of delta functions. So it's saying the signal itself as a function of time, well, it's just impulses at all different time intervals with a certain height given by this. And thus, the output signal is just the superposition 
of inputs with the response for each decimal function. Okay, in fact, let me call this instead of T naught, let me call it T prime. Then, it's ex then the, the formulas look exactly the same. That means the output is the weighted sum, which we're writing as an integral, of that strength times g, because each delta function gives rise to a g. So that is the picture you should have. So that's what the Green's function means. It's not just a math thing. It's just the principle of superposition. Each impulse gives rise to a Green's function, and then we weight that by the strength of that impulse. All right. So, let's see. So, we ultimately want to, the, the problem that we're, well, I should never erase that. Let me write it back up over here. Here is the input-output relation that we care about for the electromagnetism problem at hand. We want to know what is the dielectric response, that is to say, how much polarization do we get for a certain amount of electric field. Our transfer function is the susceptibility or written in the time domain, the amount of polarization we get at a particular time is the Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform of the susceptibility function involved with the inverse Fourier transform of the susceptibility function. And based on causality, we want to put constraints on what these guys are and learn something about that. Perhaps can we get group velocities that are negative or faster than the speed of light when we need. So to do that, we want to study the properties of these guys based on the causality constraint. All right. I want to use this board again. So. See it clearly. All right, so let's look at the constraints of causality on a general green function. Turn to some fairly advanced mathematics of comp functions on the complex plane. Something I hope you've seen in your math methods course. You guys all take 466, or at least you cover analytic functions, contour integration, all those goodies. I assume you have. So let me remind you of some things. So what we're interested in here is the, we have our uh, Green's function and its Fourier transform. To where this is 0 when t is negative. Okay. In order to deal with this and ask uh, what this means, how does this constrain, one of the ways we can think about this constraint on our transfer function is to do 
an analytic continuation. That is to say, we're going to treat this function on where a complex plane where now we're going to allow the frequency itself to be a complex number. This integral is on the real axis of the complex omega plane. Okay? So we have the complex omega plane where we're going to use the notation for simplicity where we use the prime as the real part and double prime as the imaginary. Here's a complex omega plane. We're doing the integral over the real axis, okay, from minus infinity to infinity. Now, we know from, recall, for, for a complex function, on the complex plane, that if I look at an integral along any contour in the complex plane, if I have a closed contour, that that integral is zero, unless there are so-called residues of the function, right? This is equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of the function. What are the residues? You recall the residues are the places when I expand my function in a Laurent series that can involve, and going from minus infinity to infinity, the residues are the places where this thing blows up at when the ends are negative. Right? All right, so what does that mean here? Well, let's look at our Fourier transform now. So let's consider consider the integral over some contour, which I won't yet specify, of this function somewhere in the complex omega plane. Ultimately, we're interested in its value on the real axis. But let's look at it for an arbitrary complex omega and write this now in terms of its real and imaginary parts. something about uh, the relate how I can express this real response function which is the integral over the real axis in terms of a contour integral with respect to the entire complex plane because I can say the following is true Let's look at the integral along this contour from 
um, minus omega to plus omega in the limit that omega goes to infinity. Okay? So this contour integral, you gotta draw it that way. Um, is equal to the integral over that part of the contour. That's the thing that is equal to g of t plus the integral over that semicircle. This is correct, and now we can say the following thing. Suppose tau is less than zero. Okay, let's consider the evaluation of this integral, which is not written correctly. Now it is when tau is a negative number. It's tau is a real number, and it's negative. Well, as we take the limit that this semicircle goes off to infinity as the limits of integration going to infinity, then the everywhere on this curve, the imaginary part is positive. As Aaron very importantly pointed out, that this had to be the right sign there. So if tau is negative, and we've closed this in the positive part of the complex plane, then this goes to zero as this goes to infinity, which it does when we take the limit that we move this semicircle all the way off to infinity, which means that the thing that we want to calculate is equal to this closed loop integral. So what we have here is the following. G of tau, the thing we want, is equal to the closed contour integral in the upper half plane of the analytically continued G. when 
tau is negative. Similarly, I could have closed this contra integral in the other direction. In which case, what we find is that this thing is equal to this. when tau is positive. So this is just plain omega in this case, is that like a um, That should be a tilde, it's all tilde. Okay. So we get two different ways of calculating this, either when tau is positive or tau is negative. However, so far we said nothing about causality. What we know is that this is equal to zero. When tau is negative. Which means that this has to be zero if we have a causal response function. We just said that if we do a closed loop integral according to the right hand rule in the complex plane, that that's equal to 2 pi times the sum of the residues. And the residues are related to the poles of this function, that's to say the places where it blows up. And since this is zero, what that says is there can be any residues in the upper half of the complex plane of this function. If it's a causal function, then G of tilde of omega has no poles in the upper half of the complex. So we've learned one important trick. If we have a causal response function, then all of the poles must be in the lower half. Line. Yeah. Um, so I forget, but by um, like poles and residues, do you mean like any order? All of them. Okay. That's right. Okay. It doesn't matter. The residues. So the residue. So if Zj is a n order pole, then the residue at Zj is equal to the limit Z minus Zj to the power n f of Z. So <laughs> uh, is that, let's see, how does that go again? Yeah, it's limiting the sequence. That's the definition. Okay. okay, so if we have a causal response, then if there are poles, they are in the lower half plane. And we can calculate the response function by looking at just those residues in the lower half plane. And the function will be zero for uh, tau negative. Let's do an example. By the way, did you cover this in 466? Yes. Hopefully, you took forces. Do we care about any cases where there are poles that cancel, or residues that cancel in the upper half plane? Residues that cancel in what sense? In the upper half plane. 
Well, they can be positive or negative. Right. And you're getting all of them, and you have to have a plan, so they could cancel. Uh, that's, a, hmm, that's a good question. I know that one says that we must, the function must be analytic in the upper half plane. G of omega must be analytic in the upper half plane. It's causal. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know what would happen to the cancel. I think I'd have to think about that a lot more carefully. My guess is that one could do other contour integrals to prove that there just can't be any poles, period. But I'm not, uh, that's my guess, but I've never actually encountered that. I don't know the answer. example of our uh, response function that we care about in our context according to the Lorentz oscillator model. Let's say we have, uh, so we, we wrote this as omega p squared, sum over this, the oscillator strengths, Omega squared minus omega j squared minus i omega j. Yeah, right? solutions uh, to the equation this plus i omega gamma minus omega j squared. So I think this equal to zero. Just multiply this group by a minus sign. So we can... Why did the sign change? Oh, because I wanted to write it as a quadratic equation in omega. I just multiply this in by group by minus. This is now I can just use the quadratic formula. And I didn't want to have to carry around the extra. And should that be omega, not omega j? Uh, yes, it should be important. Thank you. Now it looks like a quadratic formula. Uh, so the roots of this, there are plus and minus roots. Minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared hey, where are we from? minus 4 times A times C over to A. We're solving for omega, the roots of that formula. Okay? So here are the roots. Omega j plus or minus is equal to minus i equal to two plus or minus something I'll call omega sub j. Omega sub j is equal to the square root of the resonance frequency minus you know, the square root. Okay, so those are the roots, those are the poles, and I kind of drew them where they are. They're in, they're on the minus, they have a negative imaginary part, the imaginary parts are negative, and then its real parts are symmetric 
which it must be, because the overall function was real and we know that we have the positive and negative frequency components appropriate. Let's calculate, and we'll do this as our last thing, and then we'll continue to derive the Cromer's Cromer's relations next time. What is the real response function? Chi as a function of tau. Well, according to uh, the formula that we have, this is zero if tau is negative. And if tau is positive, we have this guy expand, extended into the complex omega plane. But that's just related to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues. Now, this is in the wrong direction. This is the left-hand rule. Because it does, there is an orientation to the contour, which would be 2 pi i. So it's equal to minus 2 pi i times the sum of the residues. All right, so what are the residues? Well, they're the residues of this function. Okay, so it's minus i times the residues, sum of the residues, or the residues of. So there's two poles and thus two residues. There is a residue. So let's let me write out again chi tilde is equal to omega p squared over 4 pi times omega minus omega j plus times omega minus omega j minus overall minus sign because I factored it out. It's omega squared, right? These, these are the roots. And then I have to sum over all. denominator out factoring that quadratic factor in terms of its roots. Okay? So there is a residue at omega j plus, which is equal to minus of p squared over 4 pi, the oscillator strain, j plus. Plus. That's the residue of that function at j plus. Plug in, get rid of that, plug in j plus, that's the residue. And then there's this one at j minus, which is the same thing, but now j minus minus j plus equals minus. Plus. All right, let's put it all together and then we'll call it quits. And I'll review this next time.
is thus equal to We have i times the residues, so that gives us sum over j and j. i e to the minus j plus tau over plus. This i is tau. Simplify that, you get the following expression. So the Green's function or the response function in this case, is the following. It is a damped oscillator with a frequency, well, for each, for each J frequency omega j, which is the square root of the resonance frequency. So, what is this? Remember what we said is that the response function is the impulse response. What are we doing? We have a harmonic oscillator. I have a ball peen hammer. Maxwell, bing. It rings. It rings at, and, it res, and it oscillates at a frequency which is, here I've assumed under damping. I've assumed that the damping is such that it's, is, that the resonance frequency squared is still bigger than omega squared of 4. It rings with that frequency and it damps. That is the Green's function. If I wanted to know how my driven oscillator responds to an arbitrary function, all I have to do is convolve this damped oscillator with the force. And that will tell me how the function responds to an arbitrary driving function. Okay. Review your complex analysis. And we will continue this next time.